Thank you so much for tuning into this uh, live chat about clarinet tone. The uh, most important thing to all clarinetists, and if it isn't, it should be, uh, in my humble opinion. Um, uh, you're here, you heard about this from Van Doren, Facebook page, and all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, I'm here with two great friends, well, three great friends, actually. Uh, and uh, Andrew is my colleague who works at Dance Incorporated. Uh, for Van Dorn in the United States, and I'm here with uh, Greg Raiden, who is the principal clarinet of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, associate professor of clarinet at SMU, and adjunct clarinet faculty at the University of North Texas, and Michael Wayne, uh, associate professor at the Eastman School of Music. Uh, I've known them both uh, for a very long time, and we've had lots of great conversations about all things life, uh, uh, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and above all, and most importantly, good clarinet tone and how to get there. And that's why I kind of thought uh, you two guys would be terrific. Because I know you guys are also friends. Uh, it'd be terrific to talk about this sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to just start with the questions that I kind of sent to you guys just to kind of get the ball rolling as I search through what I, uh, what I said here. And, of course, now I don't find them. But I'm going to try this wild without notes and see what happens. So let's just start this way because we want to avoid microphone issues and echoes and all that sort of stuff. I'm just going to go from Greg uh, to Michael with basically the same question. We'll see how this all goes. So um, for you guys, uh, what is a good clarinet tone? Uh, how do you guys like to try to go about getting it? Uh, were there any anything throughout? your learning that inspired you? Do you listen to a specific, specific type of instrumentalist? Is it other clarinetists? Is it violinists and singers? Please, like, give us a, a clue, uh, at least what your inspiration is, and then from there we'll talk about how to get there. So I'm gonna do what everybody wants. I'll mute myself and I'll love to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Um, good tone, that's a great question. I mean, of course, there there's some subjectivity to that, but I think there are elements of of a good sound um, that that are imperative. Um, I think a good tone has to be f a sound that is focused and resonant and even from top to bottom, and that has color, um, a wide variety of color, and a sound that doesn't spread at different dynamics. Um, I think that uh, one of the best descriptions of tone came from one of my teachers, Don Montanaro, who said, and he got this from uh, something that Stokowski had said, he altered it just a little, but uh, Montanaro's description of the ideal tone was a diamond wrapped in velvet. And, and that image has, has stuck with me a long time. Uh, I think it's a, it's a beautiful description of sound uh, with that crystalline clarity and and um, solidity of the diamond, you know, with the softness of the velvet around the edges of it, and uh, and I think that's a, just a beautiful description, and and I sort of can't think of a, of a better one. Um, similarly, one of my other teachers, David Weber, and yours as well, David, uh, used to talk about tone uh, being having gold and silver in it and chocolate and and he used descriptive adjectives like that which i believe came from mclean when they were spent a lot of time together so um a lot of color and a lot of sparkle and a lot of ring and resonance um for me uh I drew a lot and draw a lot of inspiration from just listening to great instrumentalists and great singers of all of all different instruments. Uh, actually, I mean, of course, there are clarinetists I, I love to listen to, um, and we can talk about that in a minute. But um, more often, listening to great string playing, great singing, um, and drawing inspiration from that. Um, for me, singers like Fritz Wunderlich and Tito Skipa and um, 
so many great violinists and cellists and pianists um, uh, take your pick, but um, there are many that, that have inspired me over the years uh, and, and being able to take things from their playing and seeing if you can somehow emulate that on the clarinet. Um, ultimately, it should be an extension, you know, of the human voice, I think. And um, it's just, you know, it's a vehicle of expression. Um, and I think it's a great vehicle because it, it has so much range and so much color possibilities that clarinet does. Um, in terms of, of clarinet, it's that um sound that has inspired me um i would say my two teachers who i mentioned um also harold wright um some of the french masters of the past like louis Cahuzac. uh these are sounds that i think capture a lot of the qualities that uh, i've mentioned Shall we, great. Uh, we, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll chime in. Yeah, my, <laughs> it's yeah. Pretty, I, I don't really know what to say after that. It's great. <laughs> you sort of checked every box, so it makes what I'm going to say easy. Okay, um, thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks We're finished. Everybody. We're finished. We're finished. We're all done. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, just to, where, where Greg's uh, started in terms of, it's always difficult with students when you're talking about tone because it it can be so subjective at times. You know, you, I remember taking auditions or playing for different teachers and you get, some people here are, are drawn to a certain sound. And so what, what is a player? What am I trying to do with that sound? Uh, or what, what, what do people like? And it's, um, I think there's common elements there and there's also things that are just, people have unique sounds. So um, I think in a very generic way, a, a good sound, whatever that means, does have a really nice balance. So you've got lows, you've got middles, you've got highs, you've got that resonance that draws a listener in. Um, I think what I've spent a lot of time over the years is trying to figure out, okay, what is that and how do you do it? You know, it's, it can be so abstract, uh, I think, for students. And um, I think it comes down to how you fundamentally play, as Greg said, an extension of your breath or your voice. That's always, what am I doing fundamentally where I can um, sort of eliminate this break between my breath and this instrument so it can be um, a very clear, easy connection. Um, and then I think part of it too is how does, how does, it's not that your setup is making your sound, but how does your setup work within that? So, and when I was thinking about this, what are things about sound, um, what are attributes about sound and playing um, that are important other than dark, bright, whatever that means? You know, if, if the sound, if you can't respond, if you have no hold to the sound, if it's out of tune, you're never gonna have a good sound. And I think it's, it's all of those attributes that a lot of students especially, but even professionals, it's so obsessed about what is that quality of sound. There are all these other things that, that go along with it. Um, so I think the biggest thing now for me, it was when I was young, was um, I want to sound like that, or I wanna, I'm listening to this clarinet player or this singer, and I'm going to try to emulate that. And I think that's really important, especially early on. But for me, it's it's being authentic to what, I want out of a sound and not what I think someone else wants to hear or um, and I think that comes through you know there's players over the years that I've heard maybe I'm not really drawn to their set like uh, checking off the box of what a good sound is but I'm totally drawn into their playing because it is so convincing and I think that authenticity goes a long way on what do you want out of, out of a sound and that's going to come through. Um, you know, when I was young, taking orchestral auditions, I always I made the mistake numerous times, where I would think to myself, "Well, I know this person's on the committee, and I know they like this type of sound." And I tried to do do something that I thought would they're going to like it. Every time I did that, it was a failure because it wasn't me; it wasn't authentic. And so that, that's a big part of it for me too. Is that each person has their own voice and what is that in finding that? 
And then with, with that, having that balance of sound, how do you create resonance? Um, and because ultimately what it is, is you're drawing in a listener, you're a performer, you want people to be listening to you and drawn in and uh, not spacing out when you play and thinking about what they're going to do for the rest of the day. And, you know, you want you want to draw in a listener and that's that starts with the sound. So um, in terms of inspiration, um, I was fortunate with my teachers early on just to give me a, a, a good concept of sound. And I think a lot of that was that foundation of just how do you how do you start a note? How do you, uh, you know, whether it's tongue position, embouchure, all of those things. Um, I think though that the biggest thing for me was I obsessively listened. I would just sit in the music library at school all day and go through just catalogs of recordings. Um, I remember actually, he, I, I came to Eastman as a student for one semester and I was, I remember being, I spent almost every day at Sibley in the listening room, just going through archives of all these different instrumentalists and singers and, um, trying to find out what am I drawn to? What, what draws me in as a musician? And how can I uh, incorporate that in my own playing? So I think a lot of it was just listening to a variety of things. And it, it's not even just classical, different jazz players. And um, that I think is really important to um, just to get a full scope of what's out there and then how I can put my, my own stamp on it. All right, so you've come up with your concept and you've thought about how you do it. Um, what are some of the things that you guys have done, you know, as, you know, as students physically, not so much, you know, taking from inspiration from outside, but in that practice room or in that, uh, on that stage, what did, sorts of things did you guys do to approach, to get closer to what you're looking for, uh, to that sound and that, that style that you guys have? Michael, you want to go first? Michael, you want to go? Sure, I can go. <laughs> um, let me just, it's, it's hard to talk about this for just you know, in a small amount of time. And maybe one thing I'll bring up that was, um, that made a big difference for me uh, is I think as a young player, even into my first job, I think the concept of sound was never something I, I was, uh, I had plenty of challenges. Coming up with the concept of sound was not, not the, the main issue. The thing I always got was, I need more contrast. I need more, more sound, I need more of it. I never really understood what that meant. Um, and so when, in my first job, I would just push more. You know, I just push more air. Um, but that never really worked either. It just, I started, actually the sound got worse. It would start to spread. Um, when I got to Boston is when I, I really started to understand the difference between dynamics and resonance. What, what is a resonant sound and what is just being really soft to really loud. And there is a difference. Um, I think probably playing on that stage at Symphony Hall makes it very clear because uh, you don't push in that hall. You don't need to push in that hall. You don't need to force. Um, and so I was you know, listening to the, my colleagues in the section there, um, an inc incredibly resonant sound. And what were they doing? And I would sit there just trying to figure out what is going on. So in terms of how do I get that sound, for me, the, just a couple larger things that I think about, um, I think historically American clarinet players are taught some kind of tongue position. Um, I don't, I teach it in a slightly different way, but I do think sort of the, the tongue position affects sound. And I think especially towards the back of the tongue really affects quality of sound, uh, focus of sound. But what I found with that, that difference between dynamics and versus resonance and control of resonance is actually the efficiency of your air again, going off of an extension of your air through the instrument. And so it's finding what is the most efficient way to get your air through the instrument. Um, I think I have, I, I know what that is for me and I, I teach that with my students, but it is 
that is what resonates. You know, if you are, it's a analogy many people use, but if you're thinking of your air as water in a garden hose, if you've got these kinks in it where your air is going in different directions, that is not efficient air and it's going to, you're going to have to force more air to get more sound. But getting um, a very efficient airstream through the clarinet makes for um, an ability to, for me to control resonance, but also control color. Um, so it's, I could go on with this for like three hours on details, but I'm trying to keep it kind of wide and a little abstract. But if people have specific questions, I can go more into that. But I think for me, it's how, uh, the air, how efficient the airstream is um, and how you can make slight changes in the shape or speed of air to get that different resonance or color. Yeah, great, great points. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I would say um, one thing, <clears throat> just talking broadly, uh, about tone and and how to get it, I think one of the most fundamental things uh, is having the concept. And I think um, I was fortunate, as was Michael, to have strong um, models of that um, from from a fairly young age. Um, <clears throat> of of good tone um but you have to have the oral concept um and you have to know what it is you're trying to produce otherwise you, you there's you have no chance so that that's really the first and most important thing i think is having the concept in your head of what it is you're trying to sound like what what is this sound this color i'm trying to make um, so that's, that's super important. Um, I think often students aren't quite sure what it is they're trying to produce and they sort of just accept what comes out and, and that, that's, that's a big problem. So first have the concept. Sure. It can evolve and it can change, but you should have a concept. Um, even if it's, imitation at first, you know, um, but imitate something good, you know, uh, then, you know, hopefully it evolves in, into something that's truly yours. Um, but things that I know you've all heard before, but practicing very slowly, things slowly, long tones, slow scales, slow thirds, but, but doing them very critically not just by route, uh, so that you can really listen to the sound, that you listen to the changes between the notes. You know, is the sound staying the same? Are the connections smooth? Is the sound spreading? Is the intonation going sharp or flat? You know, things like this. Um, so that when you're doing it slowly, you're doing it very critically. Um, just playing fast all the time, you know, is not good and and um you won't hear all these real subtleties of sound so so that's really important um recording yourself a lot i think is is really important and these days we have so many great devices that the sound quality is is quite good certainly good enough to hear these discrepancies in in sound quality um I think, you know, we can be our own best teachers. And, and uh, so doing that was super eye-opening for me, particularly when I was auditioning a lot. Um, and we didn't have as fancy equipment as, as is available now, but um, could still learn a lot that way. Um, and, um, you know, having equipment that enables you to produce what is in your ear with the most ease. I mean, that's what equipment is about, really, in my opinion. Um, so, 
yes, I think it's important to try equipment and, but, you know, keep in mind that that's the goal. What enables you to do what it, what it is you're trying to do to, to be expressive and, and have a, a wide range of expression, like Michael was talking about, with the most ease and the most reliability something that responds well, something that plays in tune well, um, and something that gives gives you a wide range. That's that's what equipment uh, is truly about. Um, so, you know, there, there are, there is equipment that might have a beautiful sound, but <clears throat> the intonation is not so reliable. So, you know, that might not be your best choice or something play on um just doesn't respond well that also is probably not a good choice so you know these are all all things to to consider a question i have for you guys uh, that i often i mean i'm ashamed to say but i still question kind of everything i do as i'm practicing and, and maybe that's over analyzing i don't know but you guys remember distinct points where you're in your development and growth where it was like okay wow no i need to do this different and then it takes it to the next level and then after that i mean you you had moments or it made adjustments where you saw an evolution i mean that's i think people want to know this or should should uh should know that it's not from day one it's set or you know, I'm sure you've had specific moments along the journey that have stand out to you. I think for me, even I, I listened back when I was a kid, you know, it, there's still, I can still hear me. Like I don't, it, I don't listen back. It's like, oh, it's a completely different player. I think when I look back, there's a slow progression, but the, the concept has stayed fairly the same, but I know I've, there's certain aspects like I talked about with the resonance and understanding what resonance and how to create it that's changed over the years. Um, I think the thing that's really important, uh, and I do this with all my students, is to be really honest about yourself as a player. And I start with what do you do naturally really well? And that could be sound or it could be technique or articulation. Um, but also being, I think for me, is really being honest on things that I really needed to work on to be very critical. Um, and I, it's not something that I'm, I'd be constantly thinking about because then it's just self-esteem issues. And, but So I know what I do really well, but also what I need to spend my time working on. And so, like I said before, when I would get comments, I need more dynamic contrast and what that is. Um, I would develop all these exercises to try to, okay, I need to expand my dynamic range. And I didn't just say, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. My sound is great. I, I, I was always trying to figure out how can I add another another layer um, to myself as a musician and how can I communicate uh, clear to an audience. Um, so I think it was just a, a very gradual progression. Um, I think the big thing for me musically was going to Boston and hearing uh, all these different players. Um, let me just, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this just... Uh, it just has come to mind, actually, Greg, like experience with Greg when I was a student. Um, and I'm sure he doesn't remember this at all. But I remember, and this did make a big impact on me with sound because I had never heard anything like it. When I was a student, I went to National Orchestral Institute, NOI, and Greg was the coach one of the weeks. And I don't know if Greg remembers this, but we were doing Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. I think Alcides was playing first and I was playing second. And we were in a coaching and I put my hand in my case to get like a pencil and my reed knife was in the case and I sliced my finger. <laughs> and so I remember uh, there's blood and I, uh, I don't know, I put something on my finger and Greg picked up his clarinet and played second on Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. We're doing the last, I remember it's, I know, I actually remember the exact phrase. We're doing the um, last movement and I was just holding my finger. I moved to the I think, back of the room, Greg started playing and there's a second clarinet solo 
ta ti ta da pa pi pa pa. Uh, and I had never, I was blown away by the resonance of sound because my I had fantastic teachers, but I never, I had never really studied with someone for an extended period of time who played every week in an orchestra. Um, and I, that was, I think, one of my first times where I, I was able to hear that. And that it was just this real incredible, incredibly stable, resonant sound. Um, and I think for years after that, I really had that in my in my ear. Um, so th there was moments like that where I where I played with an oboist at some festival, and that there's some that again that resonance or stability in the sound. And over time, I think it just uh, the way I was as a player just evolved to where I'm at now. So it's it's experiences like that that are really important and. Um, obviously, again, listening, but also hearing people in person. I don't know if I would have got that just by listening to a Dallas Symphony recording. It would have been great, but to be in the same room and hear that was made a huge impact for me as a student. So I don't know if that answers any, any question, but it just came to mind as I was looking at the screen. I, was, I, I do remember that very clearly. Um, from That was probably 2000. 2001, something like that. And you haven't used a knife ever, ever since. Ever since. No. Right here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there, I mean, there are several moments um, I can think of. I mean, one was hearing my teachers play as well. Um, both my teachers, David Weber and, and Don Montanaro, played a lot. And just hearing the sound um, up close and in person um, had a big impact. Um, hearing that resonance in that ring uh, of Mr. Weber and, and the, just the beauty and control and refinement of Mr. Montanaro um, was so impressive. Um, it was just like hearing a great singer uh, and he could just pick up his clarinet and, and uh, any note, any dynamic, just with just the most beautiful control and, and um, singing quality. Uh, or pick up my clarinet <laughs> and do it when I was having trouble with something. Uh, and fluidity uh, was always made a big impact. Um, another sort of aha moment was gradual, but made a big impact was um, I played in an opera orchestra for three years, and then I moved to the National Symphony, and I got to sit next to a great clarinetist, Lauren Kitt, and that transition from the pit to a big orchestra was took some adjustment um, because in the pit there we didn't have to play at the volumes that I did in in the orchestra, and Lauren was extremely helpful with that transition. He under I think he understood what I was going through. He understood my training, also coming from Curtis and knew what it was I was trying to hold on to, this ultra refinement that was um, really uh, beat into me. <laughs> I mean, I gladly accepted it, but I didn't want to lose that, but I had to learn how to play more expansively. And Lauren was so good at that and really helped that out. It was an adjustment with reads mostly. Um, and just learning to trust yourself that you could play play more expansively and, and not lose that. But um, he, he was uh, incredibly impactful um, to me in that respect. And um, so I owe him a lot for that. Uh, so that, that moment uh, or that year was, was um, I feel like, really changed a lot in that year. Um, <clears throat> and then just doing the job in Dallas from getting the job to um, 
just having to do it every day. Um, you just, you kind of learn on the job, you know, um, get used to the load of work and, and just having to quote perform, you know, three or four times a week. Um, you, you just figure out, you figure it out. I mean, I know that seems like smoke and mirrors a little, but, but you do and, and you, you make the adjustments sometimes without even knowing that you're doing it. So we have a few questions uh, from Michael Tran. How do you teach a student the difference between equipment that works for their sound and equipment that works against their sound? Well, I think, um, you know, concept is really important of course how you approach the instrument um to me i'm a response freak um and so you know teaching them that it has to speak in neutral playing just set up with your embouchure and your and your normal air column which of course you have to teach them what that is you know without forcing and things um but um, so they they have to sort of learn that idea. Um, it's a little more difficult now with COVID to have them try in your setup and things. Um, but that was something that I that I did do or try theirs pre COVID um, to make sure that they knew what a balanced responsive setup was. Uh, I think that's super important um, and you know, make sure that they're on a mouthpiece that I know will, with with the right read match, speak and respond uh, in the correct way. Now, that's not to say that there's only one mouthpiece for everyone. That's not what I mean. But, you know, I believe in a closer facing mouthpiece. That's just my training. But also, um just what i believe can get the kind of sound that i sort of prefer um now there are people who sound very good on one more open things that i'm not i'm not saying that they don't but um to just bleed into tom's question about this tendency towards open more open and more harder reads um I I don't fully understand the tendency. I think the tendency is coming from people trying to get bigger and darker sounds and thinking that that's the way that you do it. I don't totally agree that that's the way you do it. I think it's possible on closer facing mouthpieces, but you can't force. You can't just blow and force on a closer mouthpiece um, because it'll shut down. That's not not the way you approach that kind of mouthpiece, as as I know you know, Tom. Um, but um, so I think people just want to be able to put a tremendous amount of air in and um, feel like they have the range to do that, and I and I think that's why they go more open and with stronger reads. Um, that, that's my, my hunch on that. OK, so to, <laughs> to Michael's question about uh, works for their sound and it, uh, versus against their sound, I, I would totally agree with what with, with, with Greg uh, had brought up. I, I would just add, like I said before, um, what works for their sound versus against their sound to me is just the equipment needs to fundamentally work. Uh, like Greg, I mean, from an early age, both of my main teachers, it was being when they were, I, I'll never forget just sitting there next to Richard Hawkins and Fred Orman uh, and them trying equipment. And it was just an open G with no bite, with just and the, the open G just comes out 
incredibly easily. You don't have to grab for the sound to come out. It's all about that initial response. I, Tom Martin in Boston would always talk about the hardest thing about playing in the orchestra is coming in. You know, you, you go to play a solo and the conductor just waits a little longer. You can't just come in. You have to be able to come in at any time. Uh, and when you're on the spot, I mean, that's when you really know if a setup works. You can noodle around in a practice room all day long, but under pressure and you have to come in pianissimo on this note, it's got to work. Um, on the other side of that, I've had setups that do that, but they also, I have nothing to blow against. And so I, I struggled with that for a while. I always had the response, but then, like, as I said before, when I tried to open up, there was nothing to hold the sound. And so you need to have that, I would, I would call positive resistance once you, once the note starts. And so for me, it's always, I think what works for someone's sound is to get that a really nice balance of immediacy of response with positive resistance when you put air through the instrument. That's, that's really what I'm looking for. Um, and I think when you don't have that ease of initial response, it's, it's always going to work against whatever sound you're going for. Because you're always going to be manipulating just to get the note out. I mean, if the note doesn't come out, who cares? It's it's meaningless. <laughs> my my brother used to be a tennis pro, and I, as a kid, I would take lessons with him, and he'd always ask, "What's the number one rule of tennis?" You know, I, don't know, I don't know. It's to get the ball over the net. <laughs> it's you know, it, your sound doesn't matter unless it comes out. You know, it's you, it's got to come out. Um, uh, with the, I mean, maybe just to build quick, just quickly on that. There are setups though I found over the years that have actually gotten those two things of the initial response and hold, but then it is lacking going back to that resonance or core of sound. And so it's, it's not just if it responds and has hold, it's going to be a great setup or it's going to be perfect for you. You, you know, it's got to have that. It has to have that. And from there, then you can, this has the type of, it allows me a certain color of resonance and different mouthpieces or barrels or clarinets allow that. And I think I was on, I did a, another podcast last week and we, I, I talked about equipment. I would just also keep in mind that if it's, if you're looking for a setup thing and working on sound that you don't get trapped into thinking, Oh, this, this person plays on this mouthpiece. So it's going to work for me. Well, they, they play on a different clarinet than you do, which has different resistance points. And there's all these factors going on. So um, I think to transition to Tom's question of the tendency of more open and harder reads, it's it's hard to know without the actual specifics of someone's setup, like what instrument they're playing on. I, I always play close mouthpieces. Growing all my teachers, you know, M13 Lyre style facing. That's what I played when I got the job in Boston. Maybe 10 years ago, I switched to a more open facing. Uh, I was completely against it. I mean, like, because I was always close facing. This works for me. I think this is. Um, but I tried everything, you know, I, all these different close, medium, open. Um, and I th for me, I, I don't. I'm open, uh, open to whatever <laughs> type of facing or equipment. Uh, but again, you have to have the right read for it. Um, I, I would agree with Greg, though, with just the amount of sound and keeping it dark, and that's maybe the tendency people are going for. I would just make sure if people are trying that stuff that you can still respond and you're not manipulating and killing yourself. Um, and that tends to be something that happens when they get, they hear these great players who, who play on those style of setups, and they try to emulate that. But then it, it really messes with a lot of the fundamentals and lots of tension and so um i think there are great open mouthpieces i think there's great close mouthpieces and finding what a good balance for you is um the, one of the benefits uh, of my location is that i get to see and meet a lot of players from a lot of different places uh from a lot of different schooling and you know when someone comes to this van Dorn studio to try things I, I mean i hear them searching and looking you know i hear them addressing something that they don't get in their equipment that they're they're looking for to attain by trying another reader, different mouthpiece or 
or the like. And I think the tendency to open mouth pieces, well, so an open, more, more open mouth piece, for example, I'm just gonna speak very simply. I know in France, in general, they play more open mouth pieces than we do here. That's a, a, a gross generalization, but when I studied there for a few years, everybody was playing like a B40, but they weren't playing number four reeds or three and a half plus reeds. <laughs> three and a half plus didn't even exist at that point. They were playing lighter reeds on that open mouth piece. Um, so I think it was maybe a tonal thing. People playing on harder mouthpiece, harder reeds, excuse me, I, th I think is a comfort thing as well. You know, uh, I, I'm, I've said in just about everything I've ever been in, I'm a, 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 an attempted recovering biter when I play. I mean, I know that about my playing, so I'm constantly trying to take pressure off the reed, but I've used firmer reeds to kind of counterbalance that, not without other issues. So I think, I think in terms of equipment, it's it's a balance of functionality and the sound. And people, if you know, if you want a darker sound, people might try to get that from a darker piece of equipment. Um, but it's always a, a trade-off. If you could go back to your 15 or 18-year-old self, what are three pieces of advice you would give yourself? And it can't be anything like buy Amazon stock or anything. I want like. I want like three points that you would tell yourself, let's say when you're in high school, right before, let's do that. You're in high school, right before your, your auditions for conservatory, right? Three pieces of advice, short pieces of advice because we have a, a good question from Tom. So. I think the biggest, number one, patience. I was not patient. Patience in every aspect of my studies, of my life, just there's time. I never thought there was enough time. Had to get it done immediately, it has to be perfect today. Patience. Um, well, if it was in high school, I, you know, not to get too specific, but have um, opened myself up to more options in terms of my path. I think I was a bit narrow. And so to keep my options a bit wider, I think would have been helpful for me. Um, and I think the last thing which I'm finding now is I wish I had taken more notes. I wish I had, I have an okay memory, but I wish I had a notebook of, of my lessons. And I have all my students have a notebook and I grade their notebook every semester because I want to see them physically writing it down not even in their computer or, well, I've got a recording of it somewhere. No, I want to see it written down. And I wish I had that from the earliest of age and just, just to look back and because I, things will come to me where it's been 15, 20, 25 years where, oh, that's what they were talking about. And I, I think if it was actually written down, I would have realized this years and years ago. So I would have made it a point to take more detailed notes. I would, I would second the notes thing. I have some, some notes and I have some recordings of lessons, which are on cassettes, if anybody remembers those things. <laughs> and, um, but uh, that, that would have been, that would have been uh, really nice to have more handwritten notes. Um, the second thing is, I would say, practice more. <laughs> um, I mean, I practiced, but I think more, I would have, I think I would have done more. Um, certain things came fairly easy to me. And so maybe in some of those areas, I think I should have worked harder. Yeah, I think. I think perhaps some of the the music academic things I could have worked hard on my theory and ear training classes um, that would probably have been been a good thing, but I just you know wanted to practice the clarinet and play and go to rehearsals and didn't spend as much time on that as I probably should have. Two questions. We're gonna we're gonna work on these two questions, and I think we'll probably wrap it up at then, unless you guys have these answers in lightning speed. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. We can ask Michael, what is your read routine? <laughs> Ligatures, how many do you own? And do you change them on Change them Okay, read routine. Um, my, all right, all right, without getting into like a whole thing on reads, what do I do? Uh, I have a very detailed read routine of breaking in my reads gradually over, I'd say the entire routine is about two weeks or so from start to bringing it into rehearsal slash concert, you know, 14 to 18 days, gradually increasing. I, I, I do adjust my reads with a read knife. Um, I balance them. That's basically all I do at the rails and the tip. I do that only after day 10 or so, once it's well sealed, I do not work on them prior to that. Um, and I make sure that they dry out appropriately. That's a big thing people don't, I find most students don't understand that they're not staying wet too long or drying out too fast and adjusting my storage, depending on seasons, especially in Rochester or Boston. Um, that's a very, very general overview of what I do. Um, and I think playing in Boston, playing four concerts a week and playing every single piece on pretty much every concert, I had a huge rotation of reads. Everything from probably six, 10, 12 month old reads to that week or that day. And I always had four, about 40 of those, 40 reads in rotation, depending, you know, always going. So there was never an issue with reads. Unfortunately, I had Van Doren to help me. Um, <laughs> okay, um, ligatures. I have absolutely no idea. I'd say we should have a contest. We should count our ligatures with Greg. Here, let, let's just do this. I'm in my studio. Okay, here's one box. Oh, here's, here's two. There's another box. This is, and I have a studio at home too. Let's say 100 and some, over 100, I would say. Okay, I probably have 60 barrels on my desk right now. Um, uh, I, I can tell within seconds if it's not right for me. <laughs> and within minutes if it's, if it's right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't take me long. And, and David can can attest to that. He's seen me go through enough mouthpieces to know that. Um, ligatures, I, I'm up there with Michael, over 100, I'd say. <laughs> um, and do I change among them? I, I have a little rotation that I change among. Um, and that might, the rotation might change. But I have probably four or five that I, I kind of rotate uh, amongst. Um, I'll find if I change mouthpieces that sometimes I'll change the ligature that one might just match a little better to another mouthpiece. Um, or the seasons sometimes, you know, the reeds are playing a little bit brighter or duller that, you know, one ligature can, can help that a little bit. Um, so, so I find um, a little rotation is not a bad thing. Also, the acoustic. Sometimes, if you're in a dis different acoustic, a different ligature can just give you a, a, a little help one way or another. Um, and oh, read routine. Um, so for me, about about a week of breaking them in. Um, probably longer would be better. Um, I'm less patient than Michael. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I find about a week, um, sometimes a little longer if, if I'm being a little more patient of, of just playing them gradually a little bit longer. Um, also not, you know, letting them get too dry or too wet, um, balancing them um, is mainly what I do. 
Um, I use read rush most of the time and a knife a little bit down lower on the read. Um, sometimes that Van Doren wand, uh, the glass wand. Um, but um, I start with a read that's fairly close in strength. So I'm just doing, um, not taking off huge amount of wood, but more, again, more just really balancing to get full vibration. Um, and, um, but I mean, my reads will not last. I mean, with the three or four concerts a week, that'll be pretty much what they'll last. I'll get through the, the week on those reads. Um, and then, you know, then they, they get put away for like a one-off concert or something. Um, but I can't rely, rely on them for the next week. Then, then I have to use what's in the new rotation. But I wish I was as disciplined as Michael. <laughs> I'll have to get some tips. But I think the important thing is just that students have a routine. You know, it, it's, it doesn't have to be specifically what I do or what Michael does, or, but that they have some routine. I'm always amazed when students have no routine. They just play a read till it dies or, you know, take a brand new read out of the box for a lesson or something. And um, so that, that's not good. It's, it's really important to rotate reads and have a routine and keep them stored in something that keeps the humidity, you know, fairly constant. And um, those things are super important. So I, I try to get students to get on the ball with that. <laughs> Guys, thank you so very much for taking a part of this. Thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in and watching. Uh, but if you or don't follow us on the various platforms, please do. Uh, you can even sign up for our weekly newsletter where we talk about topics that are pertinent for students, teachers, pros, uh, and the like. So, uh, again, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for for sharing and uh, uh, take care, everybody, and uh, be well. Thanks for having. Thanks for having. Thank you. Good to see you guys.